The author Robert Fulgham tells a wonderful story about a present that uh, about about his daughter who who gave him a present, uh, a unique present, one day many years ago. And and by the way, her, her name was Molly too. Uh, seven years old. Seems that Molly loved to make bag lunches. And so it's at the age of seven, she took it upon herself to make bag lunches every day for herself, her dad, and her brother. Well, one day, uh, she made her dad two bag lunches instead of one. Her dad said, Robert Fulgham said, what is this? And she said, oh, it's just some stuff, just some stuff. I, wanted to take you, I want you to take it to take this stuff with you to work. And so he did. And later, while eating lunch, he opened the second bag with all of this stuff in it and poured out its contents, and inside were two hair ribbons, three small stones, a plastic dinosaur, a seashell, a marble, two chocolate kisses, and 13 pennies. Fulham smiled and thought, oh, isn't that precious? A few minutes later, without even thinking about it, he threw both of the bags into the garbage can. And as soon as he arrived back home, Molly greeted him at the door with a big hug and a question. She, she asked him, she said, where's my bag, Daddy? What bag, he responded. Uh, the bag I gave you this morning, you know, it had all of my favorite things in it, Daddy. My favorite things in the whole world. I thought you might like to play with them. And I forgot to give you this note. Well, now Fulgham's stomach is churning. He said, oh, I, I, I left it at the office. And, and she then hugs him again and gave him a note that reads, Daddy, I love you. Fulgham writes this. He says, Molly had given me her treasures, all that a seven-year-old held dear, and I had missed it. Not only that, but I had thrown it in the trash. Dear God, what have I done? And so as Molly went to bed that night, he headed back to his office, and he pleaded with the custodian to allow him to go through the trash as long as he needed to find what his daughter had given him. And when he finally found a brown paper bag, he carefully cleaned the onions and the mustard and the pickles off of the things that his daughter had given him. And Fulgham then concludes with these words. He says, I wonder how often in this sweet life I have missed the treasures right in front of my face. A friend calls this standing knee-deep in a freshwater river and dying of thirst. Standing knee-deep in a freshwater river and dying of thirst. That's probably how Martha felt the day that Jesus stopped by for a visit, at least the day that we know about in the scripture reading for this morning. Martha lived in a, a teeny tiny village called Bethany. Uh, Bethany was a small village on the east of Jordan. It was located on the southeastern slope of the Mount of Olives, about two miles east of Jerusalem on the road to Jericho. And it derived its name from the number of palm trees which grew there. Martha had a sister named Mary and a brother named Lazarus who lived together with her there. And they were all very, very, very close friends with Jesus. Well, Jesus stopped by Martha's house for a respite, for some refreshment, to get some well-deserved rest. You see, Christ was physically worn out. He was physically worn out, and he had a whole lot on his mind. He knew that in just a few short weeks, he was going to be crucified. He could see the cross. He could see the nails driven into his hands and his feet. He could see the Roman soldier taking that, stole, that sword and jamming it into his chest where blood and water flowed. He could see the crown of thorns. 
He could see the, the mocking and the ridicule and the humiliation. And, and he could see the betrayal of Judas and even Peter. He could see the rejection of all the disciples as they fled like a bunch of chickens when the chips were down. He could see it all. And he needed a little bit of rejuvenation for the journey. He knew that the time was quickly approaching when he would feel a physical pain and even worse than that, a spiritual pain as he was separated from the Father. The first and the only time in history in, in the entire eternity. Spiritual pain far beyond anything else any other human has ever experienced or will ever experience. He knew that his time on earth was short and that one reason why he kept up such a, a torrid pace of ministry. You see, before Jesus was crucified, what he wanted to do more than anything, I believe, was for everyone, everyone he could possibly reach to hear his message, the good news, the message of forgiveness and salvation, the message of new life, eternal life, so from the time you woke up in the morning until the time you went to sleep at night, he would preach and teach and heal anyone and everyone who was blessed enough to come across his path. In fact, the day before he visited Martha's house, Jesus spent from dawn until dusk teaching throughout Galilee, and now he was on his way to Jerusalem. Christ was exhausted. He needed rest. He needed refreshment for the journey ahead. And so he stopped at his good friend Martha's house. He just knew that Martha and Mary and Lazarus would be like an oasis in a dry, hot desert. They would give him comfort and rest and support and sustenance, both physical as well as emotional. And through their prayers together, surely spiritual. Now Martha, being the eldest woman in the house, was responsible for feeding her guests. Mary's role as the younger sister would have been to help her older sister. That was the Jewish tradition, Hebrew tradition. That's what you did. However, there was Martha alone in the kitchen, working furiously to put a meal together for the Lord. Um, she probably thought, you know, hey, Mary's going to show up to help me any time now. And so she waits. A few seconds pass. Some minutes pass. No Mary. This is not biblical, what I'm about to share here just in these couple of sentences, but it's likely, like most people, Martha probably begins to talk to herself. You ever done that when you're up tight? At first, it's quiet. When you want to get somebody's attention, you know they're in, they're in the other room. First, it's quiet. You kind of talk low like this. You know? And then it gets a little bit louder, and you talk louder, louder, louder. And then when they don't, they don't quite get it, get louder and louder and louder. So everyone in the house can hear. Does any of this sound familiar? <laughs> Finally, in utter frustration, <coughs> excuse me, Finally, in utter frustration, uh, Martha goes over to Jesus. She just leaves the, the oven. She goes over to Jesus. And she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of this work by myself? Tell her to help me. All she is doing is sitting there at your feet, listening to your every word. I need help, and I need it now. Somebody has to prepare the food. Somebody has to set the table. Somebody needs to pour the water. So, Lord, please, please, tell Mary to get up and get a move on it. And Jesus replies, I believe very gently, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. 
From the very moment Jesus arrived, Martha and Mary were doing two very different things. Martha went straight to the kitchen to bake a loaf of bread. Mary went straight to the feet of Jesus to partake of the bread of life. While Martha was spending time in front of the oven, Mary was spending time at the feet of the Savior. Martha made work her priority, but Mary made Jesus her priority. Martha was distracted and worried about many things, but Mary was focused on one thing, one, and that was being with Jesus. Martha had opened her home to Christ. But Mary had opened her heart to Christ. Which brings me to these very important questions for each and every one of us. And for those of you who will see this service, this message, and hear it in the future. If today Jesus arrived at your home, what would you do? What would I do? How would you spend your time with him? Would Jesus feel like a welcome guest in your house, as it is right now? As it is right now? Inspired by a poem written by Lois Blanchard, I ask you, if Christ were to knock on your door this afternoon to spend a day or two, if he showed up unexpectedly, what would you do? Would you hide some magazines? or videos, or dust off your Bible, and put it out so that he could see it, hoping that, well, he might think you've actually been reading it. Would you turn off the radio and hope he had not heard what you were listening to? Would you hope he, he did not hear you shout that last dirty word that you yelled at your spouse or the TV set? or at the computer? Would you hide your worldly music? Would you invite him to take a look with you at all the things that you have been looking at on the internet? Could you let Jesus walk right in? And would you ask him to, or would you ask him to come back later as you hurriedly begin hiding things and throwing things away. If Jesus Christ himself spent a day or two with you, would you go on doing the things you often do? Would you continue watching what you normally watch on TV? Would you continue looking at what you often look at? Would you continue reading what you often read? Would you continue listening to what you often listen to? Would I? If Jesus was literally with you, would you keep right on saying the things that you often say? Would you tell him the same jokes that you tell your friends? Would you invite him to look at your checkbook and your debit card history? so that he could see where you spend the bulk of your money? Would you take Jesus with you everywhere you plan to go and still buy what you plan to buy? I mean, as he walked with you uh, through the supermarket checkout line, would you still look at those trashy magazines and tabloids? Or would you look the other way? Would you be glad to have a meet with your closest friends? Family members? Would you hope that they would stay away until this visit with you ends? Would you be glad to have him stay with you day after day after day after day after day? Or would you be greatly relieved when he at last went away? It's an important question we ask ourselves, extremely important. What would you do? What would I do? If Jesus Christ in person came to spend some time with you, or with me. Brothers and sisters, have you 
like Martha invited Jesus Christ into your home? And more important than that, have you, like Mary, invited Jesus Christ into your heart? Have you asked him to take complete control of your life, complete charge of your life? See, the truth of the matter is, Jesus, Jesus doesn't need to knock on our doors to know what we're thinking, saying, or doing. He doesn't need for us to invite Him into our house to take a look around. Why not? Because He knows it all already. He knows it all before He even knocks on the door. He knows exactly what you do in private. He knows exactly what I do in private. The other day, my faithful wife, Kristen, she said to me, wouldn't it be life-changing if we thought of Jesus being right next to us every moment of every day? Wouldn't that be life-changing for us all? I knew what she was getting at. See, the fact is, He is. He is. He is. We don't have to think it. We don't have to imagine it. He literally is. He is beside us. He is behind us. He is above us. He is before us. He is within us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. He is with us at the breakfast table. He's with us on the couch. He's with us uh, as we sit on the recliner. He is with us in the car. He is with us everywhere we are. And He knows everything we think, say, and do. Everything. But here's the main point, and please don't miss this. Knowing that, knowing that truth, understanding that truth, knowing that Christ is always with us and that He knows everything doesn't have to make us worry. It doesn't have to make us discouraged. It doesn't have to make us anxious. It doesn't have to make us fearful. In fact, it can be the most liberating, freeing, joyful, exciting truth we have ever known. Ever. How? You ask? Well, I mean, if you need to rearrange your priorities, Christ is right there to help you, to show you the way. If you need a fresh start in life, Christ is right there to give it to you. If, if you need forgiveness for some really bad sins or some not so terrible sins, whatever, here He is, the Lamb of God who poured out His blood for your forgiveness. He's right there to give it for you. If you need peace, if it's peace you're looking for, who better to turn to who is right there with you then the Prince of Peace, the one, the only one who can give you a peace that transcends all understanding. If your body is weary and needs rejuvenation, who better to turn to than the one who says, come to me, all of you who are tired and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. If you want strength for the journey ahead, who better to spend time with than the one who is with you always and can enable you, can enable you to fly on the wings of eagles? Sisters and brothers, think about it. How can we Christians lead others to drink from the fountain of life when we haven't gone to the fountain ourselves? We can't. How can we be the light of the world as Christ calls us to be when we haven't spent time in the light of Jesus' presence and His truth? How can we be the salt of the earth when we haven't spent time being salted by the Savior? And where is the Savior? Right there. Right here. Right with you. Right with you. He is closer to you now and always will be than the very breath you breathe that I breathe. I'm going to close this message today with a story. I think it's a story that encapsulates what God wants us to hear and understand. 
One day a man's daughter asked the local minister to come by and, and say a prayer with her dad. When the pastor arrived, he found the man lying in his bed, his head propped up on two pillows. There was an empty chair beside his bed. The pastor assumed that the chair was there for him and that the older gentleman had been informed of his visit. And the pastor said, I guess you were expecting me. No, he replied. No, he wasn't. Who are you? And the pastor explained, I'm the pastor from down the road, and told him his name and so on. He said, I saw the empty chair here, and I thought, well, you know, I guess you heard that I was going to show up. And he said, oh, yeah, the chair. The chair. Pastor, do me a favor. Close the bedroom door. Stay here for just a second. I have something to tell you. I have something to tell you that I've never told anybody before. Not even my daughter. In all my life, I've never known how to pray. At church, I used to hear the pastor talk about prayer, but frankly, everything he said went right over my head. So, I stopped praying. That's when a friend of mine said, Johnny, prayer is a simple as a matter, is it, prayer is a simple matter of taking, of talking with Jesus. It's a simple matter of talking with Jesus. Here's what I suggest. Place an empty chair in front of you, and in faith, see Jesus in the chair. It's not spooky, because Jesus promised in his word, I will be with you always. Just speak to him in the same way that you're talking to me right now. And so, I tried it, I tried it, and you know what, Pastor, I liked it so much, I've been praying freely to Jesus ever since. In fact, most days I pray to Christ about two hours a day. I'm careful, though, if my daughter saw me talking to an empty chair, she'd either have a nervous breakdown or send me to the funny farm. The pastor encouraged the older gentleman to continue doing what he was doing and then prayed with the man and returned to the church. Two days later, the daughter called to tell the pastor that her dad had died that afternoon. And the pastor asked, well, did he die in peace? She said, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, most assuredly so. I was leaving the house about 2 o'clock, and he called me over to his bedside, and he told me that he loved me so very deeply, and he reached out his arms, and he gave me a hug, and then he kissed me on my cheek. And when I got back from the store an hour later, I found him dead. And then she said, but um, there was something quite strange about his death. Apparently, just before Dad died, he leaned over and he rested his head on the chair beside his bed. And with tears in his eyes, the pastor said, if only all of us could go like that. Brothers and sisters, if only we all had that kind of faith. If only we all had that close of a relationship with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. To know, to really know that He is indeed with us. Through the good and the bad, through the joy and the suffering, through the smooth times and the rough times, Jesus is always with us. Sisters and brothers, Jesus is always, always, always with us. He is always with you, and He knows everything. Everything. As big as your imagination may be, his love for each and every one of you is far greater than you can ever imagine. And you know something? He has promised to never, ever leave you. Nor forsake. 
So please, please put your hand in the hand of Christ. Lean on Him, trust in Him, love Him as He loves you. And live your life in the knowledge that He is with you always. Please, please, please do not make the mistake that Martha made. And that is, live your life like you're knee deep in a river of fresh water, yet dying of thirst. Don't let it happen. Make time and take time to drink from the fountain of grace, the fountain of His grace, and drink from it often. And you know something? If you do, if you do, surely do, you'll never have to worry about anything. And you'll never have to hide anything either. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, please, please help us to live this day and every day leaning on your strength, trustfully, respectfully, patiently, peacefully, and confidently. Please, God, change our misguided priorities and tendencies, rid us of our selfish, fleshly desires and make our desires conform with yours. Break our destructive habits, Lord. Protect us from the enemy and lead us in the way everlasting. In your holy and glorious name we pray. And the children of God say, Amen. Brothers and sisters, Please stand and sing with me just a closer walk with me, page 38.